Um, hello, you can hear me. Yes, my name is Dusan Malkovich. Um, and uh, you are currently witnessing the very special edition of uh, Queer Pride Studies in, two, uh, in 2022. Yeah, you can, you can see it on the banner right there. Uh, Gillian, Jill, Jill Pope, Jill Pope, yeah, that Jill D. Pope, yes. Uh, she uh, is our guest from the University of Melbourne and she's going to talk about uh, drag, Belgrade drag queen, queen performances and in the context of uh, post-Yugoslav political space. Uh, be my guest, Jill Queen, do your magic. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dushan. Thanks for the invitation and thanks to the Institute. Um, it's a real pleasure to be back here. Please bear with me. I'm a little jet lagged. Mercury is in retrograde. Mm -hmm. It's all happening. Um, uh, but yeah, let's go. Mi se ne bojimo naše komunističke prošlosti. Da, da, dobro ste čuli. Hvala. Um, so in June this year, in Belgrade, the Dragoslavia Festival was held. It was the largest drag event to date held in the Balkans region. Um, it started as a digital event during the pandemic and has now expanded to live performances. It was founded by a group of drag performers from across the former Yugoslavia under the tagline of Sisterhood and Unity, play on the original Brotherhood and Unity. And you just saw Belgrade drag performer Marquisa de Sada open the event with a quote from Dusan Mikovaya's film, Mysteries of the Organism, which says, we are not afraid of our communist past. She goes on to say that the artists performing created Dragoslavia from the ashes of Yugoslavia. And you can see here that the Dragoslavia logo references the Yugoslav fag flag. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Freud. Um, <laughs> but uses pink instead of red as a subtle reference to the trans flag. Um, so today I'm going to be presenting on one aspect of my doctoral research project, looking at how drag artists in Belgrade re refashion memories of Yugoslav socialism through their performances. So I'm actually currently in the middle of doing my fieldwork in Belgrade, so I'm using some relatively new empirical material to think through some of my theoretical lines of inquiry, particularly in hauntology. So in this paper, I will explore examples of drag performances in Belgrade that refashion memories of Yugoslav socialism in order to argue that drag performances and identities could be considered what I call spectral fabulations, post-human apparitions that disrupt linear time and act as forms of other utopianism. Ultimately, I suggest that understanding these performances as hauntings opens a path to explore how the past becomes a resource for queer futurities, which imagine alternatives to the political depression experienced by queer folks in late post-socialist Belgrade. So I know or imagine um, that many of you do have intimate knowledge of Belgrade's drag scene, but for those of you who don't, I'll first give some background to the drag scene in Belgrade and why hauntology is a useful framework for examining queer performance in the city. And using then my empirical material, I'll then explore some of the different aspects of Yugoslav socialism that drag performers work with. But before we get into that, um, as a queer and feminist feminist researcher, I think it's important to situate myself to this research um, and also to anticipate my most commonly heard question, why is an Australian studying drag in Belgrade? Um, so I'm fond of saying that I came to Belgrade to find my past, but I ended up finding my future. Um, so my grandfather was born in a little town called Selavats um, <laughs> that Adriana is very familiar with. Um, about an hour or so from Belgrade during World War I. Um, he was taken as a prisoner of war to Germany during World War II and migrated as a refugee to Australia um, in, in, in 1950 with my father, who's pictured there on the left. Um, so all of this to explain, because I didn't know my father's family, why it is I'm speaking in English when I am in fact Serbian, um, and also why I'm here. Um, Okay, so enough about me, let's get back to drag. Um, let's look at a little timeline of drag in Belgrade. 
Um, in the early 90s, uh, sorry, in the 90s and early 2000s, there were only one or two drag performers in Belgrade. Viva La Diva and Caramella, who was doing a kind of version of drag on television. Um, and I've also heard rumors about a small ballroom scene during the 1990s held in apartments featuring local performer Agatha Von Dyck. But fast forward to 2012, a new group of performers kicked off what we would consider the contemporary Belgrade drag scene. You have here Marquisa de Sada, Sonia Saizor, Decadenza, and Diana Ho, who is no longer active. Well, not as herself, anyway. Um, but between 2016 and 2019, there was a significant new wave of drag performers popping up, encouraged partly by the increasing popularity of RuPaul's Drag Race and the regular uh, drag race viewing parties held in Belgrade. Drag collectors House of KG and House of Plastics were formed during this time, and many more independent performers arrived on the scene, some lasting only one or two performances. Some are still active today. Uh, in 2020, as I mentioned before, the pandemic saw drag in the Balkans region shift online in response to the inability to hold live events. The Dragoslavia digital show was formed by the transnational group of performers, including Belgrade's Decadenza, and expanded throughout 2021, holding regular online performances. And once restrictions were lifted, from 2021, a new um, suite of drag competitions held by now established collectives, House of KG and House of Plastics, attracted yet another new generation of performers, and new collectives such as Nez Brunuti emerged out of this generation. So over the last 10 years, the number of performers in Belgrade has steadily increased. Today, there are around 50 to 60 active performers in the city, as well as some in regional locations around Serbia. More are popping up all the time. In total, there have been around 90 to 100 performers across several waves or generations, although many of these are now inactive. And a special thanks to Deca Denza, um, who helped compile this uh, very important data as well. So these days, regular drag parties are held in the city each month across a range of venues, along with special events such as Dregavizia or the Halloween Monsters Ball, as well as pride parties, drag race viewing parties, so on and so forth. Belgrade drag has become so visible that performers have even appeared on Serbian television and YouTube shows. Now the performers are very diverse. They occupy a range of gender and sexual identities. There are many cis men. There are also non-binary folks, cis and trans women performing in female drag. There are also some drag kings, although it's worth noting there are significantly more drag queens than kings. Performers span genres and styles, from classic fishy divas to camp queens to club kids and more conceptual drag identities. And now these have been joined by the small but growing group of performers who engage with the socialist Yugoslav history. So let's look at them briefly. Um, and unfortunately, I won't have time to examine all of these drag identities in performances in detail this evening. Um, but here you have Gospodja Paretsa, who we will discuss later, as well as Novo Slovenka. Um, we've got Marquisa de Sada and Decadenza performing a socialist mix, um, and Aurora Obscene, who created an art video as an homage to socialist Yugoslavia, as well as some promotional materials from the Yugo Chic Drag Night and the Dragoslavia Festival that I mentioned earlier, and we will discuss a bit more. I, what I find really interesting is that most, not all, but most of the performers engaging with these memories are too young to have any lived experience of socialist Yugoslavia. Most of them were born in the mid 1990s at the earliest. And part of my interest in this research was understanding why the Yugoslav legacy has such an enduring resonance amongst young queer performers. But why look at drag through the lens of hauntology? Well, for me, it's one way to avoid the trap of the subversion debate that has characterized a lot of research on drag. As Kate Stokoe points out, this can lead us to problematic characterizations of good, i.e. politically subversive drag and bad drag. And this has been echoed in some of the um, small amount of literature that's been written on Belgrade's drag scene. But I'm personally more interested in what else drag does in Belgrade and to understand why it has become so popular. And in this case, I'm interested in how drag works to queer memory, particularly the memories of socialist Yugoslavia. And why is hauntology a useful framework in Belgrade? Well, many have depicted the city as a spectral landscape. And Kvetkovic describes Belgrade as a city haunted by violent histories that renders the traumatic as picturesque. 
architectural historian Liliana Blagievich says that post-socialist Belgrade is a place where phantoms multiply and archaic phantasms haunt the experience of space, while Branka Arsic writes about the haunted landscape of post-socialist Serbia as a nation of spectres, where the past refuses to disappear. Socialist Yugoslav is one of these phantoms that looms large in the city, as you all know, despite the fact that in post-socialist Serbia, Yugoslav memory has become a contested terrain, discredited both by local and international actors. On one hand, the multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multicultural project of Yugoslavia is not viewed as compatible with the Serbian political elite's nationalist agenda. There has been a deliberate campaign to erase socialist memory through historical revisionism, as well as by removing traces of the socialist past from the urban space, such as street names. On the other hand, as Gal Kian and others have written, Western Europe and its institutions actively seek to frame any socialist past in Eastern Europe as totalitarian, something to be left squarely in the past on the march towards the capitalist utopia of neoliberal democratic nation states. But despite this, as you all know, Yugoslavia is very present in Belgrade's urban space. And some of these reminders are due to necessity, such as the socialist housing blocks in New Belgrade. But some speak to more effective links and nostalgia, like pictures of Tito that still decorate the walls of certain bars and cafes. Yugo nostalgia has even become a form of tourist commodification, with accommodation, tours, and bars evoking the former federation. Beyond this, what Tanya Petrovich calls the effective histories of Yugoslavia, the stories and memories of those who lived through the Yugoslav period, are kept alive, transmitted to younger generations through family and friends who have lived experience. So it is in this spectral landscape that Belgrade's thriving drag scene has emerged. Now, drag has become another way to transmit these memories and reinsert them into the present and future through what I call spectral fabulations. So I want to just go into this um, oops, uh, conceptual framework a little further. So Spectral Fabulations connects Grace Cho's understanding of ghosts and hauntings as a mode of memory and an avenue for ethical engagement with the present, with Tavia Nyong'o's framing of queer performance, in his case, queer black performance, as fabulations, a mode of survival or tactical fictionalizing, which permits an investigation of possibilities outside our present terms of order. So here are a few key points that underpin my understanding of drag performances and identities as spectral fabulations, which brings together literature on hauntology and queer performance. So firstly, is that I see a connection between ghosts and drag identities as post-human apparitions. And I wanna emphasize here that I'm talking about the drag identities or characters as post-human and not the performers themselves who are very much anchored in the real human world. Ghosts, as we know, exist in a space between life and death. And Nyong'o, in his writing on Afrofabulations, writes that fabulations emerge from the indeterminacy and flux of living and dying. And while they can be ephemeral and fleeting, they also live on as poetic and aesthetic performative strategies. Like ghosts, drag identities exist between life and death, going through a cycle of birth, death and rebirth with each performance. I acknowledge that historically there have been many cases where the distinction between the permanent identity of a drag performer and their drag identities have become blurred, a fluidity that is closer to trans embodiment. But in the examples discussed here, drag identities are laid to rest, even if temporarily, as costumes and makeup are removed and the drag performer returns to inhabiting their body. Exploring drag identities as post-human also connects to their own genealogy as a queer art form and legacies of queerness and queer bodies being dehumanized. Jack Halberstam and Ira Livingston have discussed how drag identities occupy the space at the margins of the real in their writing on post-human bodies. And Anna T's exploration of drag performance in Athens emphasizes how these performances foreground the connections between the dehumanization of deviant bodies, both queer and Balkan, the Balkans region long being associated with monstrous figures such as the vampire. And this has particular resonance for Belgrade's drag performers when considered alongside us, such as description of how Serbs perceive themselves as those who are neither alive nor dead. <laughs> well, 
So, so. Um, the next aspect that links drag performances to hauntings is their shared ability to, dis to disrupt and confound linear temporalities. As Avery Gordon states, haunting raises spectres and it alters the experience of being in time, the way we separate the past, the present and the future. Performances also work to distort and alter linear time. As Nyong'o reminds us, fabulation can rearrange our perceptions of chronology, time and temporality. In this way, drag, also a focus of Nyong'o's work, can be understood as key to the process of transmitting cultural memory. Um, and in this particular place, um, Maria Grzynich describes how the post-socialist transition produces a specific spectralization of represent representation, space and time. And in the examples we will look at in this presentation, we'll see how the socialist past erupts into the post-socialist present, while also being used as a resource to create queer futurities. And finally, thinking drag as spectral fabulations permits an understanding of how these performances act as forms of other utopianism, both bearing witness to past injustices and imagining alternatives to Belgrade's political depression. For Gordon, a defining feature of hauntings, as opposed to trauma, is the way that ghosts demand something to be done. She explains the way that hauntings can be considered embodied, tangible modes of action, saying that spectres or ghosts appear when the trouble they represent is no longer being contained or repressed. This again echoes Nyong'o's writing on fabulations, which he describes as the persistent reappearance of that which was never meant to appear, was instead meant to be kept outside or below representation. And in Belgrade's drag, in the examples we will look at, these concealed histories are woven throughout socially inspired performance, socialist inspired drag performances in multiple ways. They firstly act to recuperate the erased Yugoslav memory, challenging revisionist histories and mourning what was lost through the collapse of socialism, from the material aspects to the effective kinship and sisterhood at unity that transcends national borders. But secondly, these defiantly queer performances also challenge the political depression experienced by LGBTQ plus folks in late post-socialist Belgrade, recalling Sharka McLaughlin's description of drag as an anti-fascist practice. These spectral fabulations not only reinsert the past into the present, but they use Yugoslav memories to create utopian imaginings, fabulating alternatives to the present and gesturing towards a, a queer future, another form of utopianism. So before we look at the examples, I just want to explain a bit more what I mean by uh, when I use the term political depression and why I think it can be used to describe many people, particularly LGBTQ plus folks, experience of life in contemporary Belgrade. Um, as defined by Anne Kvetkovic in her book, Public Depression, political depression is the sense that customary forms of political response, including direct action and critical analysis, are no longer working either to change the world or to make us feel better. So why would, I think that political depression would be a useful framework to examine life for queer people in Belgrade. Well, at this particular moment, uh, in this context, as part of a lecture series organized for Euro Pride, it almost seems to go without saying um, that for many of my research participants, that many of my research participants would identify with this definition of political depression. Today, it is abundantly clear that for those in Belgrade's LGBTQ plus community, their lives are shaped by the ongoing patriarchy, homophobia and transphobia in Serbia. The current situation is of course compounded by historic events such as the violent attacks at the Belgrade Pride Parades in 2001 and 2010. And while on the surface seem, Serbia may seem to have made some tacit advancements in relation to LGBTQ plus issues in recent years, hate crimes and speech remain common as we've seen over the past few weeks. The Belgrade Pride Info Center has been attacked multiple times since its opening in 2018. And the complete political capitulation to the religious right by the current government in direct contravention to their own support of the Euro Pride events is the latest in a series of political disappointments for queer people in Serbia. While my participants have varying level of engagement with party politics, some, for example, are members of newer left-wing political parties, many more consistently express despair at Serbia's political landscape. Their resignation to the improbability of change leading them to disengage completely, including many who dream of moving abroad. 
For some of my participants, their entire affective state changes when I bring up this political situation in Serbia. They go from excitedly recounting their activities to resigned and gloomy in an instant, or will do their best to completely evade the topic. Others express skepticism, not only towards the current government, but also the newer left-wing parties, as well as a deep fear that something worse could come if the current government was replaced. And this politi political depression has only become heightened during the current situation with Europride, with one of my participants expressing on their Instagram stories just today that living in Serbia looks more and more like a terrible nightmare every day. I argue then that spectral fabulations are a way of combating these conditions of political depression by refashioning memories of socialist Yugoslavia. They do this by, as we discussed earlier, disrupting linear temporality and creating utopian imaginings where the past becomes a resource to fabulate alternatives to the present and future. And let's take a closer look at which specific aspects of socialist Yugoslavia these performers engage with. So there are many examples I could show you, but due to time I've stuck to a few and to draw out three main themes of Yugoslav memory used in these drag performances. So I'll particularly be looking at how these drag performances refashion the anti-fascist legacy, transnationalism, and trans-feminist resistance of socialist Yugoslavia through their performances. Thank you. Um, so this is another clip from the Dragoslavia Festival held in June, which, by the way, they'll be holding another performance at Katsagrad tonight at 9 p.m., um, where 20 performers from across the former Dragoslavia, including Kosovo, gathered in Belgrade. And here we saw all the performers from the festival gather on stage. This is a promotional il illustration from the festival showing each drag identity in pioneer costumes. One of the performers from Belgrade, Nicoletta Stalletta, who you might notice bears a family resemblance to her mother, the late Diana Ho, um, introduced her performance with a twist on the unofficial motto of the partisan movement, death to fascism, freedom to the Stalletters. The divisive and controversial Stalletta culture becomes here a tool of queer and feminist resistance, which the creator describes as a way to challenge the misogyny and patriarchy that accompanies this discourse, allowing us to rather understand the power embodied in these feminine forms and the ability to recognize the Stalletta inside all of us. And beyond feminist resistance and the anti-fascist legacy, we can see in these exam the example of the Dragoslavia Festival how it works with Yugoslav memory to recuperate the transnationalism that underpinned the project. The festival challenges the post-socialist logic of borders and the politics of nationalism that emerged in the post-Yugoslav space, uh, creating a truly transnational event, and particularly the inclusion of performers from countries that in the post-Yugoslav era have been framed as political enemies of Serbia shows a commitment to overcoming and the divisions and separations that em have emerged through years of nationalism.
Um, so this is Novoslavenka. Um, here you can see her at her debut performance in 2021, performing to Lepa Brenner's iconic 1989 track, Yugoslavenka, a joyful celebration of socialist Yugoslavia. Um, Novoslavenka also makes reference to Yugoslavia in her Instagram profile. Um, and these two triptychs demonstrate her engagement with the transnationalism of the Yugoslav project. The first shows her in traditional Slavic costume in a landscape that references the lyrics of Brenner's song, My eyes are the Adriatic Sea, my hair is Pannonian wheat. And this connects Novoslavenka's body as a queer performer to the vast landscapes of the former federation. The second triptych shows herself and fellow drag performer Lana V in Tirana, a defiant challenge to the rift between Serbia and Albania that continues to shape Serbia's political context. As Novoslavenka says, I merge two seemingly incompatible worlds into one and become the mother of all queer people who do not know or do not know how to express love for their homeland, tradition, culture and art due to the barriers of nationalism. I am the product of everything that is deep in every different Slavic man and woman, from orthodoxy through communism and socialism to Catholicism, Islam, patriotism and LGBTQ plus identity. And this is the final look. I'm now going to take my papilotne off and I'm going to let my beautiful red curls out and I'm going to put my Tito Pionirka uniform and I will be 100% ready to provide resistance to occupation forces. Ta-da! <laughs> So, meet Gospodja Perezza, or Madame Pretzel. Um, as you just heard, she describes herself as an old Yugoslav comrade providing resistance to occupying forces. Gospodja Perezza is one of the drag identities of Sonia Saizor, a trans woman activist and drag artist, and one of the founding mothers of contemporary Belgrade drag. Now, as you can see, Perezza's costumes reference the pioneer uniforms with a camp twist. Pioneer, but make it fashion. And the way that... And so the way that Yugoslav memory is embodied by mostly femme figures, more drag queens than kings, also evokes memories of Yugoslav feminist resistance, embodied by the figure of the Partizanka and later by the Yugoslavenka, as we saw in the, in the performance of Novoslavenka. And Yasmina Tumbis describes the ongoing resonance of the Yugoslavenka and how she is used as a feminist performance strategy that continues to facilitate and inspire resistance against patriarchal, nationalist and divisive politics. Drag identities such as Novoslavenka and Gospodja Perezza permit new queer imaginings of the figure of the Yugoslavenka, defying cis-normative and binary gender norms while keeping the potency of her as a symbol of resistance. And in Belgrade's drag scene, this has expanded to become trans-feminist resistance, which is particularly relevant as in recent times, Belgrade's leftist and feminist political scene has become fragmented by transphobia. So here, Gospodja Perezza holds a sign saying trans people deserve the right to employment, housing and healthcare. And Perezza's demands for material rights is closely linked to Sizor's lived experience as a trans woman in Serbia, where it has been difficult for her to assert her own bodily autonomy. Importantly, these spectral fabulations do not have a desire to return to Yugoslavia in its past iteration, but rather use these memories as a resource to create queer futurities. This is an important point because whilst Yugoslavia has significant residence, resonance with the LGBTQ plus community in Belgrade, even as I've said, those too young to have lived experience of it, Queer scholars such as Boyan Bilic also caution to not forget the patriarchal, sexist and homophobic aspects of the Yugoslav state. So I see the way that drag performers use Yugoslavia or refashion Yugoslav memory as aligning with Irina Dioli's writing on Queeroslavia, a utopian transnational space created by queer activists in Belgrade in the early 2000s that Dioli describes as a way of finding citizenship in a country that no longer and does not yet exist. So to conclude, uh, the way that drag performers refashion memories of socialist Yugoslavia as spectral fabulations is demonstrated by the way they act as post-human apparitions that disrupt linear time and become forms of other utopianism. This other utopianism takes two forms. Firstly, the witnessing and mourning of the concealed and contested histories of socialist Yugoslavia 
and, uh, and what has been left behind in the wake of its collapse. Secondly, memories of socialist Yugoslavia are used as a resource to create alternatives to the present and to become utopian imaginings, demonstrated in the examples we saw in the way that the anti-fascist legacy, transnationalism and transfeminist resistance are refashioned in new queer ways. Ultimately, I argue that the spectral invocation of Yugoslavia by drag performers in present day Belgrade works to fabulate queer alternatives to the political depression that characters, characterizes life for queer folks in the city. In the words of Gospa Giparezza, I'm not a drag queen, I'm a revolutionary. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jill, uh, for two things, for um, being fabulous and for delivering a very good lecture. So are, are there any questions from the audience? Please don't be shy. That's, I, I, I have been saying this sentence for years and years and people are still shy. I think it's kind of <laughs> cute, but we need questions for debate. Um, okay. I, I, I have, oh, okay. No, no. <laughs> okay, so oh, I, uh, yes, uh, you mentioned Caramella at the beginning. Um, he's a very famous, I, I, I don't know if he understands himself as a drag queen, yes, and whether he identifies or not, but I think he was perceived as the first female impersonator. Mm -hmm. Here, although he does it in a very trashy manner, I would say, he has no artistic or, or artistic um, as a word uh, perceived in uh, common I, sense. I heard he's not here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. But, but he's been doing this kind of trash imitation of Serbian pop folk stars, mm -hmm. yeah. But I think uh, his presence was uh, widely accepted, not um, in terms of uh, drag queen or mm -hmm. any kind of que queer performance, but, but as somebody who makes fun of those folks, diva, diva stars. But every, I think a lot of population saw him as something funny and he was uh, pretty much accepted by uh, the, by Estrada, how, how do we say, my, by, yes. So, so mm -hmm. the the art, the Estra Neumitnitz accepted him as a as a, being like a part of them, and uh, I don't know if people perceive him as gay. I don't know, but but what I'm trying to say, um, it was possible to for him to find his space and be successful in what he was doing, which is which is a very interesting thing for me. Uh, that's more of a comment. And my question, or another comment, I don't know, <laughs> would be, uh, I understand why Sonia Sizer is connecting uh, her performance and her uh, drag work with uh, Yugoslavia. Uh, because when she says uh, we need housing, we need those, those workers' rights, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, Yugoslavia uh, was a country that uh, very successfully solved all these things. And after the fall of Yugoslavia, we have seen decrease in these social rights. So uh, she, as a, as, a, as a trans woman, has a lot of material problems. And then she flows back in this uh, very good memory of Yugoslavia. Okay, so it was another comment, sorry. <laughs> but you can comment on my comment. <laughs> And um, hello, and um, just I wanted to ask you, uh, do you, uh, why is it? Th I mean, th that's what I gather from pop culture and everything. Why is it that people that imitate women on television are not per perceived as um, as uh, the most of the Serbian population perceives all of the queer artists that are drag queens, and they are accepted as something funny? whether we perceive them as uh, in, most of the time insulting to, to the trans community, to a drag community, to all the queer communities here, whatever, tr transphobic, yeah, basically. Yeah, 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 so uh, it's just, my question is, why do you think that is? Okay, 
Oh, okay, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, firstly, Dushan, for your comments. Um, yeah, I, I think that's that's such a great question, and I think maybe it it comes down to how people do identify and their intention. And I I was dubious as to including Caramella in this kind of like scope of the history, um, but I think there is a certain ambiguity maybe about their position at the time and 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 what they're kind of um, also kind of taking it in the context of the time where perhaps they wouldn't have felt able to occupy a kind of uh, less uh, mainstream identity, even if that was part of the reason for their performance. But I think it's such an, I think it's such an interesting question and it, it, and it goes to that kind of, yeah, I suppose the queerness of, of certain art forms and why, I mean, certainly in Australia, we have a similar thing with kind of, with, people impersonating women who don't kind of consider themselves in that, in a dra as a drag performer or, or this. Yeah, I don't know if I have the answer to that question, but I think it's a really interesting thing to think through. Hi, Jill. Um, sorry, I was late. So this question has been covered before. Please just shoot me down and say like, you missed it. You missed <laughs> it. Um, but I mean, I've been like following from distance and, and um, I'm so glad as well that I see actually research being done on the topic because I feel like it's really important. But I couldn't help but thinking as the emergence of the current drag scene uh, in Belgrade happened, it, it, it resembled a lot of kind of aesthetical similarities with the kind of RuPaul aesthetic of, of, of the American kind of stuff. And I was always wondered, wondering how does that kind of cultural flow of, of aesthetic of what drag is, how it's interpreted. And then obviously it doesn't, like Darker Slavery, I think is something completely different from the party scene. And so I'm, I'm kind of curious how you see that kind of interweaving and, and how, whether you feel like there is that kind of the RuPaul fever as it, as it were, and, and maybe not bored to death by it, um, but whether that kind of had any influence, if, if that makes sense. I hope I didn't miss that before. But. No, thank you. That's a that's a really great question and actually was the topic of a presentation I did at a conference a couple of months ago. Um, <laughs> but um, look, I think, I mean, I think that the, the RuPaul factor has been kind of almost like a fault line from my um, understanding of, of, of Belgrade's drag scene because I think there is a division between those who consider themselves to be engaging very specifically with this kind of global cultural phenomenon and those that position themselves in kind of opposition to that, of, of feeling like that kind of somehow detracts or takes away from a, um, a cultural expression of what drag means as an art form to them. And, and for me, I think that neither is a, is a wrong answer because I think it's completely um, understandable that people um, particularly in the way that I hear a lot of my research participants describe living in Belgrade as a place that exists outside of the EU is kind of, you know, in that semi-peripheral space, why it might be appealing to engage with something and to feel a part of, especially particularly as a queer person where perhaps you grew up not necessarily with a huge group of people around you with similar interests. And I've definitely heard stories from people where, um, RuPaul itself and the kind of characters, you know, the, the drag um, identities that have emerged from that production um, were really liberating to themselves as somebody who grew up in a small town. So um, I definitely see, I, you know, I can see kind of all of that, but I, of course it's, it's played a role, I think, in, um, in, shaping, in shaping what Belgrade's drag scene is today. Um, and I, I really, full disclosure, I've watched like three episodes of RuPaul. I'm the actually the least qualified person to do this thesis but now I have a uh, kind of contrarianism where I refuse to watch it until I've finished so but yeah thank you for the question uh, I work here at the institute not normally as a bouncer uh, uh, <laughs> Well, I mean, could be a good side hustle. So, yeah. apologies in advance. I only saw the announcement and the last part of your. But uh, uh, let me make a. You know, let me pretend that I. You know, uh, that, you know, that I caught everything. Oh, please. Okay. Uh, here we have a, 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 an example of you know uh, uh, drag community 
being uh, attached to a more inclusive, if you want, emancipatory Yugoslav or, or you know, uh, 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 you said utopian, Yugoslav identity, mm -hmm. okay? And that is in stark opposition to the dominant discourse with antagonized, narrow, mi narrow and narrow-minded national identities. Now, uh, do you think that there is something uh, intrinsically emancipatory in the drag movement or in drag identity? Or can we allow for the possibility that they can make some kind of Croatos, you know, Croato festival or Serbo festival where you could also be a drag and Chetnik and, and, and Ustasha, <laughs> you know? And I'm, and I'm asking you seriously, because for Is example, see them on Saturday. <laughs> uh, and I, I will conclude like in the last 30 years, I guess, like most or all feminists I've met and everything I've heard in the region, they were all emancipatory and inclusive and, you know, uh, but 100 years ago, it was pretty, pretty common and standard to be a feminist and to be a hardcore Serbian, you know, a nurse, collect, you know, uh, collect contributions for the army and, you know, in a way, and I would imagine that nowadays many <laughs> feminists in Ukraine are pretty hard on, you know, let's get some money and buy a tank. So uh, 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 I don't want to, like, you know, like, it, can we allow for the possibility that, you know, uh, uh, narrow mindedness can be exemplified in any form of identity? I, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that it depends kind of what lens you're looking at it through. I mean, for me, Queerness is something that kind of goes against the grain, whatever that grain might be, and that might be a kind of dominant discourse of nationalism, it might be militarization, it might be patriarchy, it might be homophobia. But within a community, of course, there has to be space for light and shade and different expressions of, of that. And I think maybe thinking about it as a kind of I don't know, this is just something that my therapist says to me all the time, a kind of both and um, situation rather than a one or the other is important that you can actually occupy multiple kind of spaces and spheres and, and maybe hold sometimes contradictory or conflicting viewpoints, but that doesn't necessarily invalidate the emancipatory um, kind of aspects of what you're doing. And I think we need to be able to hold space for that complexity when we're thinking through queerness, um, feminist, any kind of ideas of resistance, because I think otherwise that kind of gets into a little bit of what I was talking about at the beginning, which you might not have seen, but especially in writing about drag, where it can become a thing of like, and this kind of comes up in a lot of the literature, of, well, this is good drag because it's politically subversive, but this is bad drag because it's um, uh, reproducing stereotypes or, or being or misogynist. But I think there is also space to kind of delve a little bit into the layers of those and to try and understand what else might be happening beyond just a kind of binar, like a bifocalization of that, because there may be other reasons or other things going on to do with the way that different people it, kind of express themselves in that way. But also on a lighter note, there is a lot of drag, domestic drags events starting to pop up. So you could definitely kind of engage with some turbo folk drag performances if you are interested in kind of understanding it a bit more. <laughs> well, I would highly recommend them. Thank you, Jill. Uh, would you care maybe to answer uh, the question which was, I don't know, came together with Dushan's question? I think it's very important one, and it also goes well with uh, the question of political subversiveness and is, is drag politically subversive? Or, I mean, I will then also ask something, but I would be also very much interested to hear your answer to, what was your name, sorry? Jovan's name, Jovan's question. <laughs> Can I, uh, but, um, can you can you please repeat the question? I'm not sure if I, uh, I think it was about Caramella, right? Yeah. 
No, it was, it was, I mean, it included him. Um, but no, my, my direct question was like, well, why do you think that, that uh, the, like the major population in Serbia uh, uh, accepts the actors and people that act uh, in a sort of way that is really offensive to many people and then that that is just for uh, the cameras the show and everything that they do even if it's misogynistic or homophobic it's for the show and then because of that it's funny but when that is our reality and that is something that we live with and we work for that art and all of that it's perceived as uh, insulting to the major population and that is perceived as uh, um, the like ruining family traditions and everything like that so it's just my question is, why do you think that is? Why are we perceived that way? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think maybe f for me, I mean, this is just my understanding from my research. It's not the main topic of my research, so I can't really speak to it in detail. But I think maybe the key words when you said, when you described it, the kind of the mainstream as kind of being done in this misogynistic homophobic way i mean that's unfortunately the reality of what we're talking about when we talk about mainstream culture so i think maybe that's that's what you've hit on is that the fact that you um when uh queer uh, you know self-identified queer drag performers in belgrade or wherever are performing in that way they are doing something that like i said before that queerness very much is against the grain um and so I mean, for better or for worse, I think, you know, I think there's there's also pros and cons in that because it it, it allows drag to do some very special uh, and um, countercultural kind of things that mainstream female impersonation doesn't have the ability to do. Um, but I think um, that's kind of part of why there is that that kind of that division. And I suppose it's not being put into that space of a kind of yeah, queer countercultural kind of performance. Sorry, I don't know if that answers answer the question. I'm losing my mind. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to pose a question on methodology rather on hauntology. Uh, but then it <laughs> turns out that um, the questions that appeared in the discussion, I mean, they really, again, also go in the direction of the methodology. I mean, why did you decide to focus on the Yugoslav type of um, queer performance, queer drag performance, because we obviously have RuPaul, we have Trouble Folk. I mean, I personally adore the one which was six years ago, this famous um, uh, drag queen who appeared in Serbian folk dress. I, mean, I, I don't know. Oh, yeah, Dieter von Biel, I think. Which yeah. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. yeah, which is not exactly Chetnik. But you know, it spoke, I would say, much more to the Serbian mainstream, but also other type of streams. Uh, <laughs> then, you know, the little pioneer girl, at least. I mean, that brings me back to the uh, notion of hauntology. Now, this is maybe, you know, I was listening to you and I thought, you know, I think that, I mean, this is now my understanding of English, which is not my mother tongue, and therefore I'm, I'm you know, somehow in the background. But I would say that haunt, uh, haunting goes with ghosts and with the dead. And I did not understand what is exactly dead. Is it Yugoslavia only, or is it people? Um, and somehow, you know, to my mind, Serbia is probably the only country in the region of what used to be Yugoslavia. Mm -hmm which prides itself that it never led any wars and that it was not officially in any war apart from the one in 1999 when it was you know, bombed. So from that point of view, we do not have that kind of debt. And so I, I'm not quite sure uh, what kind of ghosts are behind the hauntology paradigm. I like specters more because I can see spirits and I don't know, some kind of, not evil, not evil creatures. And those were vampires also that you mentioned. Uh, and I don't know, even the authors who, um, from Belgrade that you referred to, they all kind of refer to the 90s. But as this is happening now, I am rather thinking, uh, to my mind, these people are really brimming with life rather than playing out some 
dead, deadly or some kind of death game. So even if that that dance is around Yugoslavia, which is dead, I mean, there is life, and I agree with you absolutely on political depression and on the, some kind of futurity, but I'm having some trouble with this haunting, with the ghosts, with the dead. I don't <laughs> understand who's the dead one here. You at one point even said that we Serbs are somewhere in between life and death, <laughs> which is unfortunately true, but still, I mean, I don't know whether that's, that's really uh, the best methodological, uh, you know, departure points. Um, yeah, where to start? Um, sorry, I'm just trying to think about how to formulate an answer to that. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, in terms of hauntology, um, I think that the, the, it kind of operates on on many levels, I suppose. So Yugoslavia is is dead, but is also something. Um, sorry, to go back for, to your first question, why I just focus on this? Um, this is one like this is kind of one chapter of my thesis, so it's certainly not the kind of holistic focus of it. Um, and there's many other kind of things that kind of touch on what you're talking about in terms of Dieter von Bills. And actually that kind of comes into Nova Slavenka's performance as well, which I didn't go into here because I thought it would confuse the argument a little bit, but that um, their kind of uh, story, drag story is also about kind of recuperating um, a kind of a Slavic identity, a pan-Slavic identity as well that kind of um, to take that away from a nationalist to kind of queer and take it back. And I think that Dieter von Bill is maybe an earlier example of that. Um, and that could be relevant for the question before as well. So that's that's kind of one thing on that, which kind of shows that it's a broader thing. Um, in, terms, in terms of ontology, I mean, for me, it kind of struck me, well, the fact of the matter is that whether or not you think that Serbia is a death cult, like I'm paraphrasing what you've said, but it is interesting to me that a group of young queer performers who have not lived through Yugoslavia are choosing to engage with, with, with those um, ideas and visual lexicons and motifs. And to me, that is a haunting, regardless of it doesn't have to be um, about the fact that they're, you know, of, of, of people who are dead in the past, but that Yugoslavia itself can haunt the present and, and, and I think does haunt the present through uh, phenomena such as the drag performances, but also in other ways that, that are kind of mentioned, like whether it's in the material culture of the city or the way that it continues to occupy a very prominent presence in the discourse of the political left, um, et cetera. But that's my interpretation. Um, and yeah, and you're right that the that a lot of the authors that I cite there are kind of, uh, yeah, speaking from the kind of, from a different era, like in a kind of, yeah, not necessarily 90s, but probably the first decade of the 2000s, but that's only 10 years ago. Um, and I do think that at the end of the day, like, you know, um, those types of, mm -hmm. I don't want to use the word trauma because it's not really what I'm trying to say, but the effective links um, to some of the more violent events in the history and particularly for the LGBTQ plus community. I mean, when you're talking about things like, I mean, you know, we're really seeing it play out right now. I think that there are memories and links to events that have happened in the past that will continue to kind of shape the present and the future. Um, and there's another, I didn't include it here, but in the kind of longer article I'm writing about this um, topic, um, there is a performance from Nova Slovenka where they actually use archival footage of um, like Dejan Nebrigic and um, kind of, you know, clips from the news of people, you know, of religious leaders or members of the public making homophobic statements, et cetera. 
Um, and I think that when you are seeing the way that those types of stories and events and histories kind of continue to erupt into the present um, for people who, yeah, don't have a um, don't have a lived experience of or linking to those. To me, that's when I kind of um, feel like hauntology or haunting is a uh, a useful framework to analyze what's actually happening there um, because it's not, um, yeah, I think that something like trauma has a different orientation to it and permits a different form of analysis. Um, but for me, the kind of spectral traces that kind of thread through and blur past, present and future is, um, yeah, is what makes hauntology kind of interesting to me as a framework. But yeah, I don't know if that fully answers the question, but very happy to chat further about it. <laughs> Hi, Jill. Uh, first, thank you for this amazing research. Uh, I wanted to give my peace of mind as a Gen Z kid <laughs> and, and queer kid as well. Uh, living in Serbia, in post Yugoslavian country, is a haunting experience for kids because we live in constant reality, parallel reality, where parents and grandparents live through Yugoslavian time. And they um, shove upon us their experiences. Uh, what is great about uh, Dragoslavia is that queer people took everything good and made art of it because we live two or three decades uh, after war started and after that like political hatred was created to uh, Yugoslavia to fall apart. Uh, and people don't want to hate anymore. Young people, kids, they still live on hatred here. Like you should hate Croatians, you should hate Albanians. But uh, my queer friends and outside of LGBTI community, um, I hang out around people who are sick of those stories, sick of hatred. We don't want to hate anyone. We want to spread love. And Dragoslavia is like a great project that can unite all those nationalities. And th that's what I wanted to say, like it has so much importance nowadays for younger generations and other generations to come. Thank you. Hi, Jill. <laughs> Thank you for all the shout outs and uh, for being a part of the community for so long. Um, my question would, would I, I think, most likely extend on, on what you just mentioned and what you um, talked about when you um, were presenting uh, the term political depression. Um, I could kind of hear that there, there is like a glimpse of hope in your presentation and lecture now, as opposed to this political depression. So I have kind of a snarky remark that I would like you to dissect and, and possibly discuss, <laughs> is um, how hopeful can we be that there is a better version of uh, Yugoslavia um, if we don't have collective performances by drag artists and, and queer community almost at all. So we have collectives and there is some attempt at creating collective spirit, but um, I think we, we all, here we can agree that there are not that many, um, not, not just like girl groups or duets and stuff like that, like lip sync numbers, but also um, intricate performances where you can see uh, process theater or anything that involves more group work and more collective spirit um, based on socialist tradition and communism. Yeah, so that would be it. <laughs> Thank you, um, and thank you, Laza, for the comment. Um, thanks, Drajan, that's a great question. Um, I think that's something I also forgot to say, it, it kind of connects with what Adriana said as well. I think in that, um, yeah, I think that part of, I think the fact that ghosts are suspended between life and death is also worth reiterating as well, because it then becomes not so much about a kind of dead thing, but something that 
is as much alive as it is dead, and in fact, in a kind of cool, supernatural way. Um, and I think that maybe that's a part of like what you picked up in the political like depression of and and that is a part of that framework as well that it doesn't exclude hope it's not meant to be a kind of nihilism that that that, that there is no hope that their hope can flourish actually in the most unlikely of places which is certainly what i have witnessed and am constantly in awe of and admire in belgrade's drag community i think that it's such a show of ingenuity and creativity and resilience and yeah it truly inspires me um every day i do this research um and i think that what you're talking about especially as somebody from speaking very much from inside the community um is really tricky right and it kind of speaks actually to almost the theoretical framework i use that wasn't a part of this presentation which is care and forms of critical care. Um, and I always kind of think about, um, I think it's uh, Maria Puig de la Bella Casa who, who kind of underscores that care is as much about exclusion as it is inclusion, because it's a cut, right? Like, you know, you can't, you know, there's always gonna be something on the other side. And I think that the fragility sometimes of the networks that are created in precarious environments like Belgrade's drag community or the queer community, which are precarious for all number of reasons, economic, um, social, political, there is a fragility to them. And I don't think there's any, um, uh, like I don't see it as a, a, I don't think there's anything to be ashamed of that sometimes these networks shift and and kind of can't necessarily hold everything at once because people are operating at you know in a kind of um limited capacity right like and i think that maybe there's moments where the collective energy that you're talking about like in dragoslavia kind of really comes to life and people feel that and pick up on it and it does um there is an almost like palpable sense that there is some of that socialist energy, not just in Marquise's rantings, but actually in the kind of energy in the room of the way that people are like cooperating together in a different level, in a different vibe. And um, sure, I like I, I take your point that this is not the that's that the, that's the exception, not the rule from 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 your experience. But I think you know we have to kind of take what we can get right. And the fact that they those moments still exist also speaks volumes about what people are able to achieve when there is that kind of collective mindset and goal. And um, yeah, I really hope that those types of initiatives continue to flourish and kind of propagate amongst themselves. But I completely understand what you're saying that it's actually really hard sometimes and it's not always, um, it's, yeah, and I don't want to paint um, I don't want to paint when I use terms like utopia, utopia, utopian imaginings. I don't want to paint it as some ut fully utopian experience, but I think there are cracks and crevices where that kind of manifests and th that energy is tapped into. Um, and I hope that it continues to be like that. If I may. Hello, Jill. Uh, thank you for a lecture. Um, I will try to be brief. Um, so you've identified this Yugoslav nostalgia, which is not surprising here. Yeah, it's a very common phenomenon. Uh, but my question is uh, that you can see some interest for socialist symbols in the West as well, and within the Western drag community as well. Uh, my question is, to your knowledge, would you say that this interest is also the same kind of, you know, making fun of it, mockery as is present in the uh, mainstream culture in America, let's say? Or is it also a political statement, uh, the same sort of nostalgia uh, which is present here? Am I clear? I, I, I think so, yeah. Um, nice. Thank you. Um, I'm like, well, Firstly, I like this is really my focal area of research, so I can't really speak super specifically to 
other you know specificities of drag locations but i do think that what it means to people here is is definitely very different because there is a kind of transmission of or haunting um of of an actual lived experience um of socialism that ha yeah that that continues to mark people's lives as lazar said whether that's through you know the kind of um narratives from people's parents or artifacts or memories or living surrounded you know um by it every day so i think it does it means something i i don't mean to say that it doesn't mean anything for people doing it in other places but i don't think it's as simple as a mockery well i don't think it's a mockery at all actually um and i'm yeah i'm wary even to use the term nostalgic because whilst i think you know yuga's nostalgia is a very well studied phenomenon um I think it I think there comes a point where it no longer becomes nostalgia when it's yeah and that's more of a haunting but that's my um <laughs> that's my viewpoint um but yeah I think it's really interesting to think about how um, socialism in general is kind of viewed you know is both maligned and viewed as a salvation in the west where you know I know from my experience in Australia for example it's very much you know a kind of political futurity that a lot of people would buy into but at the same time people are very wary of actually poking that too much and actually understanding from cases like Yugoslavia how it actually happened so i think it's kind of interesting to see how it's viewed and maybe mm, the west yeah should be looking at belgrade drag maybe for some like more references for for that kind of art rather yeah thanks Hello. I have a very actually hypothetical question. Um, the question is that what will be the new Yugoslavia for drag queens that will perform in 50 years from now? As such, what will they perceive as um, Serbia nowadays? What is the things that they will uh, refurnish and rebrand and refashion to express what it used to be tradition in Serbia? Wow, I love this question. Oh, like, I left my crystal ball at home, unfortunately. Um, but okay, what are we talking like 2070? I mean, I really, I really want to indulge this hypothesis. Um, yeah, I don't know. Gosh, well, how will we look back at today? That's such a scary and... <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Gosh, I, my mind, my mind boggles me. I love that question though. You, you should write a paper on it. <laughs> um, okay, I I have two hopefully last three r remarks today, <laughs> and. Um, uh, you mentioned one term which I would like to say now, and that is subversion. I would like to uh, refer to Conchita Wurst. Uh, we haven't spoke much about her, of course, because the context of your research is quite different. But I would just like to say that from my point of view, her appearance was very subversive. Whenever um, I say that something is subversive, I always um, think about what is it subverting. Well, mm -hmm. she performed as Conchita Wurst, uh, in full drag, but with a beard. So she blended uh, the two usually separated gender identities between woman and the man, and that caused a lot of scandal. If she just shaved the beard, I don't think that would cause such an, such an effect. So you can, some, some drag performances can still be seen as a very subversive, and I think it's a good way of, of analysis. Uh, finally, uh, we are going to talk tomorrow more about transphobia in, on the left and in, in, in the feminist movement, but one of the critiques that has constantly been appearing and that has been attacking especially drag queen performers was that uh, the drag, that kind of drag, is misogynist. Yeah, that it is making fun of women. When I discussed, I said, no, it's not making fun of women. It's making fun of the stereotypes of women. Uh, and now not to get into the subtle details <laughs> of, of this debate. We will do it more tomorrow. I would like 
to, uh, to comment on these two comments. Thank you. And I promise this is uh, uh, the end. <laughs> No, thank you. I think, yeah, and also just to note, like, I I am all for subversion. Um, I just think that we, that it, it can be limiting when it's the only frame of analysis for something. Definitely all for subversion and Conchito first, etc. So, um, yes, thank you. Um, in terms of, I, I think that is, that's such a good question about the, the transphobia and kind of misogyny that kind of is criticized in certain forms of drag. It's something that I think is quite, um, I think it's quite special about the Belgrade drag scene. And I I think it's something, I, I, I personally think it has something to do with um, Sonia Sizor's role in the drag, like as one of the pioneers of the contemporary scene, that I think it's actually very trans inclusive. Um, for example, recently there was a, um, a non-binary drag night held where all the performers were non-binary which i think is quite incredible for a not so big city not so big place to have something so specific like that i thought was really well and it was incredibly well attended as well um so i think that that has really shaped and made space in this particular locality for uh, transness to be very included in the drag scene and i also think that Whilst I can see the side of the critiques of misogyny and the stereotypes of women, I do think, again, without going too much into it, um, again, I kind of come back to some of the other reasons. Like, there are people that do drag who I've spoken to who do very um, photorealistic drag in a way. Like, they really, they really want to look like a, a woman. Like. And I think that there is also not, misogyny could play a part in that, but there's also, I've heard from a lot of people here that it's very difficult to express feminist as a cis gay, gay man in Serbia, and that doing a type of drag like that is a way of experimenting or engaging with or integrating that type of gender expression into themselves, into their lives, in a way that they wouldn't feel permitted to do in their everyday life. So I think that's just one example of how there is kind of other resonances and meanings here and we need to kind of complicate some of those critiques as you pointed out yourself. So. Okay, um, well, um, this was, I think, the first time Academia meeting drag and drag meeting Academia. <laughs> so we will continue. Thank you Yay. very much for your presence and see you tomorrow at 5 uh, p.m. to talk about transphobia, as I have already said.